Francis was born in Philadelphia, the son of a West Indian father. In 1971, feeling partly responsible for the devastation caused by an oil spill in the San Francisco Bay, he decided to start walking instead of riding in motorized vehicles. For the next 22 years, John walked across the entire width of the United States as well as to South America. After his decision to walk created endless arguments, John took a vow of silence that continued for the next 17 years. He wrote an account of those years in his book, Planet Walker, 17 years of silence, 22 years of walking. At the same time, John founded Planet Walk, a nonprofit environmental awareness organization. John believes that the current environmental crisis is a result of worldwide social and economic inequality, and that any attempt to resolve the crisis must not only address such scientific issues as climate change and deforestation, but it must also examine humanitarian issues. John contends that our disconnection with the earth and with one another is at the heart of our environmental crisis. As John says, how we treat each other is how we treat the environment. Please give a huge Connecting for Change welcome to John Francis. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and um, I usually start out speaking by playing the banjo and, and saying thank you for being here because after 17 years of silence, uh, thank you for being here. Those were the first words um, that, I, that I spoke after 17 years. And um, I also want to thank Mercy, 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 uh, for her fine rendition. And. Uh, I, I want to thank all the speakers, especially uh, Satish Kumar, who is, is like a brother to me, and um, Amy Goodman, who uh, really got us thinking about democracy and why we're here and what we can do as activists. But uh, I want to tell you 
about this journey that I, that I was on because we're all really part of that journey. And this journey actually started about 50,000 years ago um, when we all left uh, that great big supercontinent called Gwandalan. And uh, so we're all actually related, brothers and sisters. And I don't mean something like, oh, you know, isn't that a nice thought? No, actually, we are all from the same planet and we're all related, brothers and sisters, and that's what I discovered on the walk across the United States. And so I want to tell you right away, because you never know uh, when the timer's going to hold up that two-minute sign, and I have to wrap up. So I want to tell you right away what I learned uh, from walking across the United States and uh, 17 years of listening to people uh, that I would never have expected that I would be able to, to be in their homes and listen to their a view of what was going on and um, who they were. I discovered that, yes, environment is about pollution because that's why I stopped riding in motorized vehicles. It is about pollution. It is about loss of species. It is about loss of habitat, climate change, all those things I discovered on my way across the United States. But also, which I didn't really hear uh, when I went to school was Oh, yes, we're part of the environment. I got that. Well, I didn't hear that if we're part of the environment, then isn't how we treat each other the first opportunity we have to treat the environment sustainably or, or even understand what that is? And so environment to me became about human rights and civil rights and economic equity and gender equality and all the ways that we relate to one another. So right away, we can all be environmental activists by just uh, turning to the person on either side of us. And, and I want you to do that just before we get going. Turn to the person on either side of you and say, I love you. All right, all right. <laughs> and I want, I want to say right now, because you probably see me wandering around here looking at you and like, you know, you're a dear friend of mine. I love all of you as well. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to start the story by telling you how I got on this journey, because this is our journey. I mean, I'm here right now because you're here right now. This is our journey, and you're a part of this journey. And you might think, well, gee, this is really just an amazing journey you went on, John, but you're special. No, see, I know that I'm not. <laughs> I am special as much as you're special. And so I know that you have this journey inside you as much as I have this journey inside me. Because we all are brothers and sisters. This is our journey. My particular part of the journey began when I saw two oil tankers collide near the Golden Gate Bridge in 1971. And I hurried down to see the environmental crisis because I had never seen one with my girlfriend, Jean. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. you, you see the spill, honey? No, I don't see it, John. <laughs> now, Gene didn't really talk that way. <laughs> but that's what we call a theatrical device, you see. <laughs> I am on a stage. And I don't want you to get confused. We are in California. And so we went to see the oil spill, and we couldn't see it because it was so much fog and everything that but we could do is smell it and we smelled the spill and it smelled like a thousand gas stations when I was a little kid stuck between two Philadelphia relatives with the windows rolled up and we didn't have no air conditioning. It was bad. On the radio somebody said listen if you don't like the news go out and make your own. Said, Damn that sounds like revolution. Well, it was back in a time when people were talking stuff like that, people's parking, everything going on in Berkeley. If you don't like the news, go out and make your own. Hmm. Well, 
Gene and I turned around and we went back home. And um, I said to Gene as we were driving back, I said, Gene, you know, we should just get out of our cars and start walking. And she said, ha, that's nice. <laughs> well, she didn't last night, I remember. You know that. But she said, that's nice, John, but listen, we don't have any money. This is a sign. I said, we don't have no money. Uh, and I'll use that a lot. But uh, she said, we don't have no money. And if we start walking without money, we start walking without money, people are just going to say, look at those hippies up there walking. They don't have no money. It's something. But if we wait till we get lots of money, people will see us walking. They'll say, look at those rich people walking. They must know something. Come on, let's follow them. Now, this was way before Forrest Gump, see. <laughs> but I bought that. I said, yeah, that's probably right. We got to get rich first before we start walking. Well, that's a nice thought, huh? <laughs> there was a knock at the door one morning. Oh, no, really? Oh, that's too bad. Hmm. That was my neighbor saying that Jerry Tanner, the deputy sheriff from up the street, our neighbor, had been lost in Tamales Bay. That was this long, narrow bay. Winds had come up and his boat had flipped over. His family made it okay, but he was lost. Now, I should say, Jerry wasn't our best friend. He was a deputy sheriff. This was in the early 70s, and Jean did grow these plants in her yard <laughs> that Jerry would always come by looking for. Jean, you got that. Pull those plants out. <laughs> okay, we inhaled. And you could be president now. <laughs> but that's not the part of the story. This is another story. I said to Gene, I said, let's do something for Jerry. We're going to walk to San Anselmo. It's 20 miles away where a group of our friends are playing. Now, you probably heard this song. It's by the Youngbloods. They lived in our town. They were going to play over in San Rafael in San Anselmo, and it's, come on people now, smile on your brother. Anybody know that song? Hey, that's good. I can't sing anymore else I'll have to pay residuals. And, and, but they were playing over 20 miles away and we decided we we're going to walk there. Now how many people have walked 20 miles here in this auditorium? Whoa, <laughs> you guys know that if you leave at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to walk 20 miles, you're not getting in time for the first show or the second show. <laughs> and so when we got there about 2 o'clock in the morning, they were all breaking down and getting ready to go home. They said, John, Gene, look at you guys. You walked all the way 20 miles. That's great. Come on, get in the car. We'll drive you back home. <laughs> we decided, no, we're going to rest up. We're going to rest up the Holiday Inn. A couple days by the pool, very nice. On the way back, we're walking back, and I say to Gene, I said, you know, Jerry, he had everything. He was, he was 27 years old. He was 26. He was about my age. I was only 26 at the time. He's, he had a beautiful house, a lovely family. He had a great job. Well, you know, he had a job. <laughs> and he was happy, and just like that, he was gone. I said, look, we're walking already. We're already walking. And what really struck me is that we only have this moment right now. I said, well, there's no telling that we're going to get any big money and we're going to be able to walk. We're doing it right now, so let's just keep doing it. And my dear, lovely Jean said to me, bye. <laughs> you know, she wasn't that cold. I used that for a theatrical effect. <laughs> She said to me, she said, John, listen, you can walk, but I have a lot of things. I have to get that money. I'm going to get that money, and when I get that money, then we can walk, you know, together. But I decided that I'm going to start walking right now because it just hit me that this is the only moment that we have right now. Right now, that's the only moment. So I just kept walking. And um, I walked and I walked, and the first thing that happened, people in the town started saying, yeah, you know, John's crazy. 
You know, he's walking. This is just how he is. You know, he's from Philadelphia anyway. <laughs> the East Coast. <laughs> and uh, I called my parents up. I said, Mom, Dad, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. No, I'm not doing that stuff. <laughs> I just called you to let you know that I've given up riding in motorized vehicles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no cars. I don't drive. Yeah, planes, no. How, how am I going to come visit you? Well, no, I guess I have to walk. My dad? Why didn't I do this when I was 16? Well, tell him I didn't know about the environment then. The environment, Mom. You know. Oh, okay. It's Philadelphia. They haven't got the environment yet. It's something that happened in California's birth. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm really happy, though. I'm, I... Thanks, Mom. My mother said if I was really happy, I wouldn't have to say so. But mothers are like that. <laughs> well, there I am walking along, and people are arguing with me. They say, John, get in the car, because they say, it's crazy. One person cannot make a difference. You hear that? One person can't make a difference. And, and I'm not sure that they were wrong. I think they're right, maybe. No, no, they're wrong, right? One person can make a difference. Anyway, I decided, <laughs> I said, I'm gonna, my birthday's coming up. I've been reading and listening. I listened to The Hobbit, right? And I've been reading, reading The Hobbit and listening to The Beatles. That's it. I was reading The Hobbit and listening to The Beatles and inhaling. <laughs> Deeply. And so, and so when my birthday came up, I turned 27 years old, and I said, oh, that's a nine, that's a nine, that's a nine, that's the Beatles, number nine, number nine, number nine. And it's three times number nine, number nine. I got to do something special for this birthday. But I've been reading The Hobbit, and hobbits don't get birthday gifts on their birthday. You know what they do, right? They give them. So I had to give a birthday gift to my community because I couldn't have a big party. Ah, I'm going to not talk for one day. That'll give him a birthday gift, because I was a really good talker. You know? <laughs> I knew a lot of things, mostly everything. And so on my birthday, I stopped talking. I didn't talk for one day. That's the whole thing. I'm not going to talk for one day. And during that day, I learned something, very important lesson that I hadn't been listening. Mm, mm, mm. I talked just enough, to, listened to just enough to someone to think I knew what they were going to say. Of course, how could I tell the future? But I thought I could. I knew what they were going to say. So I stopped listening and started thinking about what I was going to say back to show them that I was smarter, that I knew more, whatever. I never heard what they said. So on this one day that I had stopped talking and I listened to people, I started learning that I had been missing learning things that I thought they were going to say. They didn't say that. They said other things, and I could learn. I'd better do this another day, I thought. And another day, I kept learning more. So I better write my mom and dad and tell them I'm not going to call anymore. <laughs> so I wrote my parents to say, listen, I'm going to not speak for a, a year. And I can't call you because I've taken this vow. So it's from my mom. Your, your dad will be on the next plane. <laughs> well, you know, mom thinks, and my dad too, that I've been taken over by a strange California cult. <laughs> she read it in Life magazine. <laughs> and so my dad shows up and he comes and he says, looks at me and, he, you know, Gene drives him from the airport and I open the door and he waves at me and gets to shake my hand and says, get in the car and I go, she says, I told you. <laughs> That's what he's like now. We went to a hotel, and I told my dad, listen, because I couldn't do the mime with him. He didn't like that. <laughs> I told him how I wanted to go to college. He says, you don't even talk, man. <laughs> Last time you went to college, you had to have a car. Look at you. You don't even have a car. You don't drive. You walk. How can you go to college? He called up my mother and he said, 
Yeah, he's okay. Yeah, yeah, he's, he doesn't do drugs. No, he stopped inhaling. No, he's still breathing, I mean. <laughs> no, people seem to like him here. I think the best thing for us to do is just leave him here in California and hope he doesn't come to Philadelphia. <laughs> no, this wouldn't work back there. <laughs> so my dad leaves me out in California to my own devices, and uh, I get a banjo, and I learn how to play the banjo, walking up and down from one town to the next town, uh, all the way up into Oregon and coming back. Um, I find the wilderness in Oregon, and the, the experience of the wilderness heals me, heals me from a lot of the things that, that really hurt me as I grew up. That we all have these hurts that need to be healed, and they get healed by the, the natural world. Well, as you know, I walked across the United States. I, I went to school and, and went to Oregon for my undergraduate without speaking and then to uh, Montana for my master's and actually taught there. You know, there's like this in my class and I said, what's he saying? What's he saying? I said, I don't know what he's saying. I think he's talking about clear cutting. No, you can't clear cut with a hand. So, yeah, you can. And I'm the discussion leader, so I let them all you know, talk about things like that. And they say, he certainly is smart, isn't he? <laughs> they say things I don't even know. <laughs> I nod my head. <laughs> I learn a lot. If, if, you're not, if you're not learning and you're a teacher, you're not teaching. <laughs> because <laughs> In Wisconsin, I get to Wisconsin and I'm, I, I get accepted as a fellow at, at the University of Wisconsin and I start studying oil spills and my, my colleagues who already think I'm kind of strange say, John, why are you studying oil spills? Nobody's interested in that and what kind of job are you going to get? Well, hunch my shoulders and take my final examinations on oil spills and guess what happens a couple of days after I finish my final examination? Exxon Valdez, who knew? Everyone wanted to know about oil spills, and there was this one person studying oil spills with a PhD in the United States at that level. And <laughs> they called Wisconsin. They said, we want to talk to the oil spill expert there. This is not taking anything from Ricky Yacht. <laughs> and uh, they, they let me go, and... I walked all the way to the East Coast where I started to write oil pollution regulations for the United States. And my dad, after I got hired by the Coast Guard, said to me, do they know who you are? <laughs> I, I, I said, I think so. <laughs> well, he says, who do, you think, who do they think you are? I said, I don't know, Dr. Francis? He said, the world certainly has changed and the world certainly had changed for him and for me, because I could have never expected when I started walking that 20 years later I would be in Washington, D.C., writing oil pollution regulations for the United States. And that's the journey that we're all on, that never expect, I could never expect, you're going to say, once you do that thing in your heart, that wonderfulness is going to happen. But Wonderfulness already has happened with all of us here because we all love each other. And that's what's going to change the world. So listen to each other, love each other, and do that thing in your heart because we're all on that journey and we're all going to do well by you being who you are. So I just want to play one from the road.
Thank you.